Turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, please. Ecclesi it really is a book. I know somebody going, is that really a book? Is he kidding us? It really is a book. Hey, by the way, I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my pastor would come to the platform sometime, and he would give this kind of a, obscure book, one that you don't hear a lot of messages that I've liked this one, and we'll all be going, come on, pastor, is that really a book? And then he'd say, okay, for all of us who memorize the books of the Bible, he said, we're going to go from Genesis to Ecclesiastes. For all of us who have memorized the books of the Bible, guess what we're going to do this morning? We're going to go from Genesis to Ecclesiastes. And so you get your thinking cap on, you got your memory. You may want to open up to about the third page of the Bible. That's where they're all listed. It might help you. All right. You ready? Here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. You slow down. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Everybody say it together. Ecclesiastes. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes is writing the book so that we will keep in mind two main factors. One is that we live on earth, but we're going to eternity. We live on earth, but we're going to eternity. And he wants us to remember that we make an impact in both places. We're just not consumers on earth, but we're contributors. And the reason that we're contributing is so that our life will matter when we get into eternity. And that the life that we live while we're on earth will impact the lives of those around us. And they too will want to spend eternity in heaven with us. We're going to talk about it today. I promise you this is not a message of gloom and doom, but it is one about eternity. And we're all going to spend eternity somewhere. Scripture says, it is appointed unto man once to die. Now, when we open up in Ecclesiastes, we're going to read it in just a moment. He's going to say in the very second, I think it's the second verse, it, there, there's a season to be born and there's a season to, if you know what it is to say, a season to die. So we're all going, we've all made the first appointment, we're living. And we're going to have the second appointment too. There's a season to be born and there's a season to die. And right now we're living in that what we call the dash. We're living in that journey part where we're doing life together. And there's people around you that don't know Jesus. There's people that maybe that your neighbors, that your maybe in your own family, maybe in the community of work that you work, some the place that you maybe your golfing buddies, some maybe some of the ladies that you shop with. There's there's people that God has placed in your life. Maybe somebody you'll meet this week. But there's people that God has placed in your life, and they're placed there intensely on purpose so that you can be a witness for God's glory and impact eternity and change eternity for someone else. So today we're going to talk about driven. What is it that's driving you right now? You see, yesterday morning I was, um, I was in Tyler with a good friend of mine who had quadruple bypass surgery this week. Guess what's driving his thinking right now? Quadruple bypass. Matter of fact, there was one that was 100% blocked. One that was 95, one that was 85, and one that was 83% blocked. The one that was 100% blocked is the one they call the widow maker. Do you think he's driven by something a little different today than what he was five days ago? Yeah, see, something is driving us right now. Something mentally is going on in your heart and your mind. Even as we were singing this morning, something had, was trying to capture and captivate, maybe even derail your thoughts from worship onto something else. I know they were for me, and I knew what I was about to preach, and I had to take those thoughts captive because I knew what Satan was wanting to do. He was wanting to derail what God had to say. So what's driving you right now? It may be your marriage. Maybe you're going through a rough spot in your marriage. And, and, and maybe for the first time in, in a long time or the first time in your life, you're, you're thinking, man, this, this could end if I don't do something different. And so you're, you're driven now to, to, to become motivated to do something different about your marriage and in your marriage. Maybe it's your finances. You're coming up and we're coming up on Thanksgiving or coming up on Christmas. And you, for the first time all year, you've realized, you know what? I may run out of money before I run out of grandkids. And if I don't do something right now, so now you're beginning to try to budget in that short period of time, so you've you got to figure this all out. So you're driven right now to figure it out. So maybe it's your health, maybe it's your finances, maybe it's your marriage. 
What are you driven with and for right now? Maybe you're in a search of a job. Maybe God has got you in a job and he's put you there intentionally on purpose, but your heart maybe is not there anymore and you're sick. You're asking the question, God, what do I do? You're in a good place, but God is driving you to, be, to become in a greater relationship with him so that you know that you know the answer. So turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's begin reading. It's not going to come up on your screen just yet. Verse number 11 will in a few moments, but I want us to read together verse 1 through verse number 8. And it says this, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to what class? A time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stone and a time to gather stone. It didn't say throw stone, just to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent. This is a tough one for me. A time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time of peace. Look down in verse number 11. It's going to come up on the screen. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He's also set in eternity in the hearts of men. He's also set eternity in the hearts of men. Would you bow with me for prayer? Holy Spirit, we come to you this morning inviting the Holy Spirit to do in us what we cannot do for ourselves. Captivate our attention. We give our attention to you. We realize this morning that we're all being driven by something, and right now we're all thinking about what it is that's driving us. And Father, if I could, could we just lay that at your feet and say, Father, I really have no control over this, which you do. And so therefore, I submit my heart, I submit my life, I submit my will, I submit my thoughts, I submit my actions in this area, I submit them to you right now. Because I know that you already know the outcome, and I don't. But I do know this. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And Lord, I want my next step to be ordered by you. So, Father, speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Dial back to the summer of 2014. It's July. Lynn and I are on vacation. We're in Panama City Beach, Florida. Ooh, if you've ever been there. White sandy beaches, clear water, five, six foot deep. You say, how do you know? Because you can't see your feet at six foot. I can. (laughs) That's how I know. I'm underwater looking down, and I can still see my feet. It's okay. It's okay. I just thought I'd think about it and say it before you did. Beautiful place. My brother and my sister-in-law and my sister-in-law's dad live in Panama City Beach, Florida, Mr. Phillips, my sister-in-law's dad, has asked me to, when he passes away, to preach his funeral. One night after dinner, Lynn and I have finished our dinner. We've cleaned up, and we're uh, getting ready just to relax for the evening. And Lynn said, what are you going to do this evening? And I said, I think I'm going to ride over and visit with Mr. Phillips for a few minutes. So I jump in the golf cart, and I go a couple of streets over, and I just sit down and talk to him. And I said to him, Mr. Phillips, you've honored me by asking me that when you pass away, if I would do your funeral, and I just want you to know that I'm honored to do so. But I have a few questions that, that, that I need to ask you before that day arrives so that you and I are on the same page. I said, my first question is this. Tell me about how you know Jesus. Tell me about your relationship. Not, not about how good it is now, but when did it start, and how did it start, and how do you know that when you leave this world, you're going to go to heaven? How do you know? And so he began telling me, he looked across the, the well, I was sitting on one end of the couch and he was sitting in a chair and he said, son, let me tell you about when I was a little boy. And he began telling me about when he was a little boy and growing up in church and his mom and dad. And he told me about that moment that he invited Jesus to come into his heart and he confessed with his mouth the Lord Jesus. And he believed in his heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And he looked across that couch and he said, son, on that fact, I'm saved. On that fact, I know that I'm getting, getting into heaven. And I looked at him and I said, that's a pretty good answer. Matter of fact, that's a biblical answer. That's a scriptural answer. That's the only answer because there's no, it's not about my works. It's not about how good of a dad or good of a husband or, or, or anything else. It's about my faith in Jesus Christ. And, I, and so we talked for a few more minutes and I said, okay, I have another question. I said, tell me this. 
when I stand before the crowd that day, your, your three daughters are there and their husbands are there and all your grandchildren and great-grandchildren and all your family and friends will be there. I said, what do you want me to tell them about you? He thought for a moment. He was a, one of these guys that had a little snicker, had a little, had, a, had a little look on his face, you know, he was a little snicker. And he looked up at me with this little snicker on his face and he said, son, just tell them about Jesus. <laughs> I said, I can do that. I got one more question for you. And he said, yes, sir. I said, is it okay that when I finish telling them about Jesus and inviting them to know our Jesus, can I give an invitation and ask for people to, to raise their hands that come to know Jesus? He said, that would be awesome. Fast forward with me now till May of this year. My brother and I have been texting all day. It's a Sunday he and I have been texting all morning, all afternoon, asking how things are, what things are doing. Mr. Phillips is in the hospital. Things aren't looking good. Late, late that afternoon, I got this text. Absent from the body, you know where I'm going, is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Mr. Phillips had drawn his last breath on this side and took his first on the next side. A week later, it's a, it's a Saturday we have flown from here to Ringo, Georgia, a little town in Georgia, and people from Colorado and the East Coast, they would merged on that little town. It's Saturday. It's time for the funeral. I'm sitting on the platform. Another pastor who was also a, a family member is sitting on the other side. His assignment was to get up and talk to the family and talk about the family. There's three girls, and they've got kids and grandkids, and, and just talk about the family. My assignment, as you've already heard, was to preach Jesus and give an invitation. So the, the other gentleman um, gets up and he shares his thoughts and shares his heart. And then he does something that's not common in funerals, but it happens occasionally. And he said, if there's anyone here that would like to share a story or a thought about Mr. Phillips and how he had encouraged or blessed your life, we want to open up the floor. Well, four people came and stood. One of them was one of his grandsons. And he had a few words about his granddad and, and how much he loved his granddad and how his granddad had impacted his life and how he couldn't wait now to get to heaven to see his granddad. And then one of the granddaughters, my, my brother and my sister-in-law's daughter, she stood up and she shared her heart, uh, Bridget, and she shared her heart about what granddad had done and mean to her and stories that they told. And, and we were just laughing and having a good time of memory. And then one of the great-granddaughters Maddie got up, and she had her notes, and she had read off all the things that she had written about her great-granddaddy. And it was so sweet, and we were laughing, and we were crying, and we were rejoicing. Then a man that, that seemed like as he stood up, a lot of people didn't recognize him. His name was Spencer. And he even said, most of you don't, don't know me. He said, uh, I lived across the street from Mr. Phillips year, for years here in Ringgold, Georgia. And he said, I remember when I would come down the street, Mr. Phillips had retired, and he was sitting on his front porch just about every afternoon. And when I came down the street, I would look over, and I, he would wave at me, and I'd wave, and I'd pull in my house across the street, and I'd go in my house and do my thing. He said, one Saturday, I was cutting grass, and after I finished cutting grass, Mr. Phillips was, of course, sitting on his front porch. He said, when I finished, he motioned for me, he said, and I, I could barely hear him. He said, son, come over and sit with me. And he thought, you know what, I have met my neighbor, I think I will. So he went over and he said, Mr. Phillips disappeared for a moment. When he came back, he had two big old glasses of iced tea. He thought, I'm going to like this man. He said, so they sat there on the front porch and they enjoyed their iced tea. He said, it was the first, but it wasn't the last of our front porch encounters. He said, you see, I was going through a lot of hardships in my life and I wasn't making always the wise decision. And he said, I would sit there with Mr. Phillips and just kind of talk him out. I just found a friend that I could just share my heart, right, wrong. It didn't matter to him. He said he, he would just listen to me. And then we'd get through, he'd say, well, would you like to know what I think? And he would share with me his wisdom of all those years. And I'd walk back across my driveway and get in my house. He said, one day I'd finish cutting grass. And like we had done so many times, Mr. Phillips had motioned and I heard that little voice, son, come on over and enjoy a glass of tea. And he said, this particular day, he, we sat there and we talked. And Mr. Phillips said to him, he said, Spencer, I'm, you know, my wife and I, Kathleen, we go to church on Sunday. He said, yep. He said, I see your car leaving every Sunday. He said, son, that's what I don't talk to you about. I don't ever see your car leaving. <laughs> he said, tomorrow we're going to church. 
and I want you to go with me. And Spencer said in that moment of time, he began thinking about all the millions of reasons, or so it seemed, about why he had quit church. He had gone to church when he was a little boy, had even come to know Christ. But over the course of time, he'd gotten hurt, things had happened, and he'd gotten out of church. And it seemed like all of those thoughts just crowded into his mind, and he was ready to say no. I, I, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm, I'm, I'm actually mad at God, and I'm just not going back. And he said he looked over and saw this sweet, kind gentleman that loved him just like he was. Never condemned him, never put him down, but always, always just offered some kind wisdom. And he said, as I looked at him, I had intended to say no, but the words that came out of my mouth were, yes. And he said, I don't know why they came out, because I have intention inside of me wanted to say no. So the next morning, sure enough, I got up and I went to church with he and Miss Phillips. And while I was there, I didn't get saved because I'd been saved a long time ago. But here's what he said next. He said, that day began my journey back into my relationship with Jesus Christ. As I was preparing this message, I wrote this statement down. It wasn't that one. Go to the next slide. <laughs> that one. Live so my life outlives me and I thought about this story you see I don't know about you but I want to live because I know that I've been born and I know I'm in the dash I'm in the journey but there's coming a moment of death and I want to live so that my life like Mr. Phillips outlives me how about you you see here's what I know we all have an appointment in eternity my question to you is this morning in the very beginning of this is where you're going to spend eternity there's only one of two places. Let me describe them for you, and then I'll let you choose which place you'd like to go. One, we're just going. One, we're going to start by just saying Jesus. That should be enough for most of us, but it's not for for all, all of us all the time. But this is a place where Jesus lives. The Bible says there'll become a day when He'll wipe away all tears. There'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death. It's already sounding pretty good. Ladies, you're going to love this. Walls of jasper, gates of pearl, streets of gold. Best jewelry store you've ever been in. <laughs> if you're not saved, just come to the altar right now and get saved. That's, that's enough right there. <laughs> Let me tell you about this other place. It's darkness. The Bible says, in this place there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. We're talking about for eternity. We're not talking about for 5, 10, 15 minutes. We're talking about for an eternity. Scripture all goes on to say it's a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. <laughs> Sounds like a simple choice, doesn't it? It really does sound like a simple choice, but why is it that it's so complicated? Why is it that it's so complicated? When, when we look at the facts, why is it so complicated that, that the decision about these two things, about eternity, is so complicated sometimes? I'm going to show you a passage of Scripture that will help you make this decision. Revelation chapter 20 says this in verse number 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. The earth and heaven fled from his presence, and there was no more place for them. And I saw the dead small and great, stand before the throne. And the books were opened. Another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to the things that were written in the books. The dead. Let's talk about the dead for just a moment. It's not talking about those just who had died, those who, had, who were dead. The word dead there is also the word that we understand this. The wages of sin is death. Death. Separation from God. That's this. But the gift of God is eternal life through my good works. No. <laughs> through my good looks. <laughs> no. Through Jesus Christ. So in that one verse, we get both death and life. The wages of sin, the payment for my sin... The payment for me just, just trying to live good, 
The payment for me just being born into this world in a sin nature, the payment for my life is death, separation from God. But Jesus. But Jesus. But Jesus died on the cross and gave his life as a ransom for my life so that I wouldn't have to die, so that you wouldn't have to die. And because of that, I can either choose or reject Jesus. Your choice. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the death that were in them. And each person, everybody say each person. That, that's an all-inclusive term. You understand that? Each person was judged on what they had done. See, oh, my goodness. It's either going to be an, it's either going <laughs> to, what it's trying to say is it's all your mess-ups, it's going to take a book to fill it. And we are all got books. But then there's one book. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Let me tell you what I know. January the 7th, 1969. I was 13 years of age. My name was erased from the books, and all my ugly and dirty and good deeds were erased from the books, and my name was put in the Lamb's Book of Life. Why? Not because I was a good boy, not because I went to church, not because I was raised in a good home, but because on that day I confessed the Lord Jesus with my mouth, and I believed in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. And on that day I became a Christian. Death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. Anyone, that's an all-inclusive word, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So here's what I know. According to that passage, where everybody's going to have that appointment, where we're going to stand face-to-face -face with God. And either our names are in the books or our name is in the book. And here's the question that I want to help you answer because we're all going to have to answer two questions when we get to heaven. Here's the first question, and that is, Mike, what did you do with my son Jesus? That's what God's going to say. And for me, you've already heard it. I'm going to stand there, not ashamed, but proud that on January the 7th, 1969, Father, I bowed my heart and I invited your son Jesus in. And if Jesus isn't good enough, I guess I'll go to hell. But from everything I read from your word, Jesus is good enough, and I'd like to come in. And he's going to open the door and say, come on in, son. I've been waiting on you a long time. I don't want to go today, but I'm ready to go. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his children. Why? Because it's a homecoming. It's a homecoming. So my question to you is where are you going to spend eternity? Let me help you answer this question. What are you going to do with my son Jesus, God would say. Matthew chapter 7 gives us some clues to how we should answer this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You say, aha, uh -huh. You see, I got to do something. I got to do the will of the Father. I, I got to just keep doing good things. I got to keep coming to church. I got to keep serving in the children's ministry because, you know, they're always short of staff and they need people over there. And, and somebody can, can get up and go over there now. It'd be okay. But because but, they're always in need in the children's ministry. And our Life Cafe, they do a great job, but, you know, they, they need help. And, 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 and matter of fact, man, I just need to serve somewhere because I need to go to heaven. Bad answer. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 9 says this. So what is the will of God? That's the question on the table now. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing, here's the will of God, not willing that any should perish, but that, what's the next word? But that all should come to repentance. You see, what God wants is not one soul to go into eternity lost. 
But he wants every soul to repent and say, Jesus is the answer. There's only one way into heaven. Jesus said it in John chapter 14, verse number 6. I am the way. I am the truth. You're not going to the Father unless you come through me. That is the answer. That is the answer that God's going to be looking for on that day. You, you don't have to quote that scripture, but you better know the answer. You say, well, what about all my good works? Continue reading in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of the Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, listen to this, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Is it possible that preachers will not be in heaven? Did we not drive out demons? Did we not perform many miracles? Is it possible that our churches are filled today with possibly pastors and people who are thinking that what I'm doing is good enough to get me there? You see, if, if I'm depending upon my name with the first word being Pastor David, I'm going to miss heaven. Because pastor has no clout. Only Jesus has clout. You say, but yeah, but you don't understand. They only ask me to serve once a month in children ministry, and I serve four times a month. I should get in. Do you have you ever changed that many diapers? Twenty something kids in one service? No, I haven't. But bless you for doing it. But those stinky diapers aren't going to get you into heaven. I'm sorry. I'll put in a good word for you, but I can promise you won't do it. You understand what I'm saying? I think the most horrible words in all of Scripture are coming up in this next verse. He said, then I will tell them plainly, plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. But wait a minute. I was there every week, Lord. I stood on the platform at Life Fellowship. If you're depending upon your good works to get you there, listen to me carefully. Listen to Pastor David. I love you. But if you're depending upon your good works to get you there, you're going to split hell wide open. And I don't want you to go there. God didn't want you to go there. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You say, how do I not go there? Romans 10, 9, I've already quoted it several times. If we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Confess with our mouth. You know what the demons of hell have never done? They've never confessed with their mouth. They, the next part says, and believe in thy heart. They know. They know there's a God. They know there's a Jesus. They know there's a resurrection. They know there's power. They can't do anything with that power, but they know there is power. They believe, but they've never confessed Jesus. So don't, hear and tell, don't sit here and tell me, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. My question is, have you confessed him with your mouth? Because if you don't confess him, you can believe all you want. The demons of hell believe, but they're still in hell. They're still running rapid in this world. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shall be, what's that last word? That's a promise, not from your pastors, but that's a promise from God. He said, Pastor, I've already done all this. I, I know that I'm going to heaven. That's step one. That's question one. Question two is this. If you can answer the first question right, once we get in, we're going to have, God says, come on in. You're welcome. I've been waiting for you for a long time. Once we get in, there's a second question, and that is, what did you do with the gifts that I've given to you? Pastor Mark just finished a great series on the gifts. If you didn't hear it or if you missed part of it, you should go get it or go online and listen to it. It's a great message. What gift has God given to you? And in closing today, I want to share three things with you that uh, for those of us who are believers, we've already settled that first question. We already know the answer. But so we're still on here on earth intensely and on purpose that God's left us here. What's that purpose? The steps of a good man, they are ordered by the Lord. What is my next step? What is your next step? What should I be focusing on? If I'm driven by eternity, what should be my drive be? Here are three things quickly. Number one, I will intentionally give what I have. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says this way. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also 
reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has determined in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What a man has decided in his heart to give. Remember the story, Mr. Phillips, sitting on his front porch? He had never asked Spencer to go to church with him. Weeks had passed. Months were passed. One day while sitting on the front porch, Mr. Phillips decided in his heart, today's the day. When Spencer finishes cutting grass, I'm going to wave him over. I'm going to get us a glass of tea like we've always had. I'm going to sit down and we're going to talk about the Braves because they won last night. That's a good thing. He was a big Braves, Atlanta Braves fan. We're going to talk about the Braves, but somewhere in our conversation today, today is the day that I'm going to invite Spencer to church. Now, for those of you who know this verse, you'll understand. Mr. Phillips could have looked at Spencer and said, Spencer, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. Because you see, what I have today is the gift of God through Jesus Christ to give to you. And that's all Mr. Phillips was doing that day. He wasn't giving him money. He wasn't giving him finances. He'd just given him what he had that day. And what he had was the love of Jesus for a young man who he saw hurting. And God spoke into his life. And what he had, he gave. My question to you is, will you, I will intentionally give. Everybody say give. give. I will intentionally give what I have. And what I have may not be much, but what I have, I give it unto you, Lord. I give it unto you. Notice the next version, or in verse number 11, that same chapter. You will be made rich in every way. When you do this, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Isn't that the desire of our heart, that God would be pleased and honored and we can give God thanksgiving for what he's done for us? That's the ultimate. So number one is I will intentionally give what I have. Number two, I will intentionally serve others. I will intentionally serve others. Now remember, we're talking about the giftings that God has given us. What are the gifts that God's given you? What are the defining things that God has said? I speak these into your life. This is the gift of God that I'm giving to you. I'm not giving it to you for you. I'm giving it to you for the body of Christ. I'm giving it to you for the world that they might know me and that, that you might point people towards me in all of your walk of life. This is the reason I'm giving you this gift. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 says this. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. You see, we don't like the word slave. You know what that word slave means? It means, it means bond servant or bond slave. What it means is you've been set free from bondage from one area of your life, and because of that, now the, the freedom that you have, you want to submit and give your life to another that's greater than you, and you want to serve this new and greater than you. Can I tell you, on January the 7th, I was saved from the bondage of the old man, and now as I live this life in the dash of my life, I want to give my life to a new master. His name is Jesus. He has ordered my steps. He has planned my days. I want to serve him, so now I become his slave. I become his servant to do his work, to do his will in my life and the lives of those around me. To use the gifts that God has given to me to speak into the lives of people I may know and people I may not know, but to do his will in my life. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Pastor Aaron and I were on a mission this, this past week. Pastor Mark had sent us up to Oklahoma to, to uh, check out this church and some of the things they're doing that would be beneficial to, our, to ours. And we're sitting in the airport and we're looking uh, out the window there. We, we've, we've already done our business and we're sitting up there and, and we're looking out the window. We've ordered our meal and, and we're just sitting there, he and I, and there's no seats. All, all the tables have been taken. And so we're just sitting there. This young lady comes up and sits at the counter there beside me. It's just a long counter. She comes up and sits there, and I, and I notice her, and I just speak to her, and then we continue our conversation. And so in just a moment, she says, excuse me, sir. She said, do, do, um, do they come to the table and take your 
order or do I need to go somewhere else? I said, no, they'll be, they'll be right here. And by the time our waitress came up, and I said, ma'am, and she was giving us our, our drink and our food and everything, and I said, hey, make sure you take care of this young lady. And, of course, she walked over, and, she, and she, after she walked away, she said, thank you very much, and we began a conversation. Being the 98% introvert that I am, it was very difficult <laughs> to do what I did next. But I asked her her name. Her name is Megan. She's 40 years old. She lives, in, she lives in Chicago. She's a believer of Jesus Christ. Four years ago, she went through a divorce. And for the next 30 minutes, God allowed me to do in public at a counter in an airport what I do in my office for a living. And God said to me, you don't have to be in your office to use the gift that I've given you. You can be sitting in an airport and use the gift that I've given you. So as she's telling me her story, she's just started dating again, and she's got this great young man that she just really likes a lot. And, and, and of course, we've exchanged. I know what she does, and I've already told her that we're pastors. And, and uh, so, you know, she's just pouring her heart out to me. My wife tells me that I have a, a gift, and it is a gift from God. That I can make a stranger feel so comfortable that they'll bear their soul. And this girl was just bearing her soul to me. We were talking, and these red flags just kept jumping up inside of me. And I want to say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. And then all these verses are coming. And she's just pouring her soul out. And I said, okay, God, if you give me the opportunity, I promise you I will do it. And she looks at me and she says, do you have a word for God for me? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I do. Here's what I learned from that. I'm a servant of God whether I'm here or whether I'm sitting in an airport. The steps of a good man are already ordered by the Lord, and God knew that Megan was going to sit next to me. God knew what time I'd be there, and he knew what time she needed to be there, so that when she asked that question, I could speak truth with love and with kindness into her heart, and she would listen to those words, and she would obey God's voice, not Pastor David's voice. Number one, I will intentionally give what I have. Number two, Do you know what an honor this is? I will intentionally serve others. When you've done it under the least of one of these, Jesus said, you've done it unto me. Do you know what an honor it is to speak in the life of someone else? Do you know what an honor it is to serve someone else? Do you know how it feels when you're, somebody serves you? They feel the same when you serve them. Number three, not only will I give and not only will I serve, but I will share Christ. I will intentionally share Christ. Everybody say share. share. I will intentionally share Christ. Second Corinthians 5.20 says this. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through, what's the next word? Who? Through who? God is making his appeal through just say me. God is making his appeal through me because I'm his ambassador. Here's what I realize. I have a choice in that. I can either say yes, we sang the song today, or I can say no. It's my choice. It's my blessing to receive or my blessing to miss. It's my choice. I close with this story. Go back to May of this year. I'm sitting on the platform. Jimmy's sitting over there. He's already done his thing. The four people have already come and shared. There's a song. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I'm next. I've already received my assignment. I know what I'm supposed to do. Back up in the story just for a few moments, just before the service began, I go over to my sister-in-law and I said, now, Brenda, you know that your dad, of course, has asked me to preach and I have had this conversation with him and and I've told him that I, I'm going to preach Jesus and I'm going to give an invitation. I just want to make sure you're aware of that and that's okay with you. To which she said, David, I've got a friend here that don't know Jesus and you better preach and you better preach good. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm sitting there. Jimmy has done his assignment. The music is playing. And I look back and I see this lady. I know exactly who she is. She does not know Jesus. See, the story continues on. This lady and her husband, they live next door to Mr. Phillips. 
Mr. Phillips had invited them to come to church. Through that, Brenda, my sister-in-law, had met her because they saw each other in the doorway talking and this, that, and the other. They become friends. Now, Brenda is inviting her and her husband to come to church, and they, for a year or so, have not entered the door of a church yet. Guess what? May of this year, guess where she's sitting? She's sitting in church, and guess what my assignment is? To preach Jesus. So for the next 15 minutes, I preach Jesus. And then I gave an invitation, just like I will this morning. And I said, if you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer with me because we went through the prayer, I want you to slip up your hand. Heads were bowed, eyes were closed, nobody was looking, the family was sitting there. And I looked over, you know how a lot of times there's, a, there's this middle aisle and there's a right side and a left side and there's a bunch of heathens on this side. Nobody got saved over here. All you heathens sit on this side. I'm teasing. And I look up this side. And all of a sudden, I see this little hand go up. The lady sitting in the back, about three quarters of the way back. She's actually sitting next to my wife. And then I saw her head raise. And her eyes and my eyes locked and tears were running down her face. And I said, ma'am, did you invite Jesus into your heart? And she shook her head, yes. There was a little boy sitting on the second row. He was the great-grandson to the man that was laying there. I said, son, did you invite Jesus to come in your heart? And he said, yes, sir. I sat down, because there's always a song, you know, that kind of closes everything out. And Brenda looks at me, gave me this stank eye. <laughs> and all I did was just shake my head. And tears began to flow. Why? I want my life that I live today to outlive me. Mr. Phillips did too. So did Brenda. You've got family, you've got friends that don't know Jesus. We're going into that Thanksgiving, Christmas season where we're going to be around all those scoundrels. <laughs> they don't need our bad attitude. They need, to, they need to see the love of Jesus. They, Scripture says, speaking of the world and those who don't know Jesus, or those who are just not walking with Jesus, they will know you are my disciple by the Love you show one to the other. Matthew 15, 16 says this. 16, 15 says this. You did not choose me. I chose you. And I've appointed you. I've given you an assignment. Your assignment is to go and bear fruit. Not just any fruit, but fruit that will remain. You see, the world offers us fruit. But only Jesus can offer fruit that remains. My job is just not to offer good fruit. Your job is not just to offer good fruit, but it's fruit that remains. So we're just not going to offer fruit that it's going to bring a laugh, it's going to bring a tear, it's going to bring a joy, but we're going to bring we're going to offer fruit that's going to last for eternity. That's the assignment that God has given to us.